Hey there. On Sunday, Yahoo News released a blockbuster article uh, talking about the Trump administration's serious attempts to kidnap Julian Assange of WikiLeaks and their probably a little less serious but still terrifying attempts to assassinate him. Let me clarify that. Not attempts, but plans to assassinate him. Um, in today's video, I don't want to get into the intricacies of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, how a person should feel or think about them. They are a little more uh, amorphous than like Edward Snowden, who's like straightforwardly a hero. I would tend to see WikiLeaks and Julian Assange as sort of somewhat heroic as well, but I get that there are other arguments against that, and that's not what I want to talk about here. What I want to talk about is the implications of this new uh, article, these new revelations, and um, what it means for the United States going forward, uh, not uh, this year or next year, but over the course of decades. Uh, if it's not clear already, this is an unproduced video. I'm not charging patrons for it or anything. I'm just hitting that Tuesday deadline, but also talking about something that I find vitally important and something that I don't talk about enough. The U.S. government is getting more and more vicious and more and more brutal, and it is slowly expanding the range of people that it believes it has the right to disrupt or surveil or, in some cases, murder, kill. Um, and this is a very bad thing. Again, it's not something that's, you know, we're not going to wake up tomorrow in a dystopian state, but I would argue that 20 years later, 40, you know, you know, we are further towards a dystopian state than we were 40 years ago. Um, I think a lot of people in the comments point out, it's like, ha, the CIA has always been murdering people. You know, the U.S. government has always been murdering people. Um, I think that's true to a degree. Um, you know, some things are just flat out conspiracy theories. Uh, some things during the Cold War, there was legitimate counterintelligence stuff. Um, and there was a pushback. Um, I think it's it's an almost forgotten thing, but in the mid-70s, there was a tremendous effort to reform the U.S. intelligence community and sort of roll things back um, from the way things were, you know, at the height of the Cold War in the 50s and 60s. Uh, it was called the Church Committee. Um, it was a uh, select committee in Congress, I believe it was the Senate, I uh, should have double checked that, that investigated all the horrific things the intelligence community had been doing before. It was very much a sort of post-Vietnam, post-Watergate thing. And one of the most important things that came out of that was a strong commitment uh, from uh, two presidential administrations, uh, Ford and Carter, Republican de and Democrat, that uh, the U.S. government would no longer be involved in any kind of political assassinations. Uh, of course, from the perspective of 2020, that sounds kind of ridiculous. The main business of the Department of Defense is political assassinations. That's, that's, that's what war is now, is sort of death from the sky uh, against people who think wrong or do wrong. In practice, what this actually means is the U.S. government killing a whole bunch of women and children and, um, you know, innocents, people who have nothing to do with the, the, the few people we are legitimately targeting, if we are legitimately targeting those people at all. Why I think this Yahoo article is so valuable is that it goes through the process in depth and talks about how the treatment of WikiLeaks shifted over the years and the U.S. government became more and more eager to uh, treat them in a more and more messed up way. These things evolve slowly from administration to administration. And the fact that we've gone from the church committee in the 70s and the aftermath of that that said that political assassinations were a no-no um, to a situation post 9-11 where political assassinations are the main thing that the U.S. government and the U.S. Defense Department does, like that's an evolution. Um, this Yahoo article lays out, you know, the sort of boring intricacies of like, how did we think about this and what was the legal authority for that? But what's important to remember is like everybody the U.S. government kills, every, you know, uh, Pakistani uh child, every Afghan wedding, all of these folks who are killed, there was a justification cooked up in the same boring bureaucratic way. And what this new WikiLeaks thing, revelations, what these, what these indicate is that that circle of people that it's okay for the U.S. government to kill is growing. 
Again, I'm not saying that the Trump administration was going to kill Julian Assange. It's clear that some of the speed rails, the guardrails within even the Trump administration worked the way they should. People were like, that's ridiculous. You couldn't possibly think of, you know, murdering this person who is a national, uh, he's an Australian national uh, living in the United Kingdom. This is ridiculous. But what's interesting and an uh, indication of how these principles decay over time is that they took the idea of kidnapping him a lot more seriously. And uh, it seems like to me, uh, my read of this very complicated article you could check out, that they would have kidnapped him probably if the UK government had, had let them do so. Um, which is which is just kind of insane. Um, this 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 sort of stretch of things that are possible. As the Yahoo article takes pains to point out, if the United States government had done this, this was in the early days of the Trump administration, this was being considered in, in 2017, they would have done this, they would have kidnapped Julian Assange without any kind of Justice Department participation. So when they were thinking about this kidnapping, when this was a real possibility, there wasn't any court case. There is a court case now, which I believe is uh, unjustifiable, but is at least a legal process where Assange would get his day in court. Um, when they were contemplating this kidnapping, they just wanted to take him. And there was no legal justification for that. So we were basically going to put Assange in Guantanamo. Now, Guantanamo is an atrocity when it happens to anybody. But the people who are there currently were people um, who were enemies of the United States under a more restricted idea of things. Again, vastly expanded since the 1970s, this, you know, but there's legal justifications behind that. There's, there's reasons for that. The Trump administration was just considering abducting this guy, who I would describe as a journalist, and throwing him in Gitmo or maybe some other deniable black site somewhere else. Uh, it's just really horrifying stuff. I'm a big apologist for Russia, but there's a lot of justified anger at some of the actions that they take. Most famously, uh, assassination attempts within the United Kingdom. Um, that's one of the things that, that I can't explain away about Russia. That's one of the strongest arguments that there's something really deeply, deeply messed up and a serious problem with the Putin administration, with, with the way that Russia works. Like, that is an irreducible fact. If you're doing assassinations and kidnappings in other people's countries, then you are a bad actor on the world stage. This is exactly, of course, the kind of action that the Trump administration was considering undertaking. And again, not against a terrorist or, you know, someone who we've got, you know, decades of legal justification behind targeting, but somebody who's basically a journalist. It's this slow expansion, um, and the Yahoo article does a great job of explaining that slow expansion under the Obama administration. It was much more leery of of uh, going after WikiLeaks to certain ways, to the Trump administration that was like, oh no, let's do it, let's do it, let's go hell hog, you know, go whole hog. Um, you'll notice that we're now um, nine months into the Biden administration, and uh, a lot of the same people who were in the Obama administration, and they're continuing the court case against WikiLeaks. This is all tremendously complex stuff, and I'm not sure I'm doing the best job of walking through it, but what I want to emphasize is that it just slowly expands, or to put it another way, just falls to a lower level. We just get more and more degraded with what um, the, the powers that the U.S. government has taken on to itself. We are slowly slumping towards dictatorship. One of the most chilling paragraphs in the Yahoo article uh, comes uh, very close to the end. You know, it's sort of like two-thirds of the way through this thousands of word, words article, pointing out that there's already a pathway if the CIA had wanted to assassinate uh, Assange. Um, you know, they sort of point out, well, there's no way this assassination could have happened because they didn't have the presidential finding necessary to do it. Um, so it's really just if the president signs a memo, um, then uh, Assange could have been killed. Um, and it didn't happen, and there were guardrails, and that, that kept that from happening. But it, it's freaking terrifying, and we know that it's already happened. Um, you know, the Obama administration had a, you know, I'd say more enlightened, more common sense, more constitutional view of what um, the U.S. government could do to WikiLeaks. But the Obama administration is also the first administration since the U.S. Civil War to assassinate a U.S. citizen openly 
um, with no legal justification, with no due process. That'd be Anwar al-Awlaki back in 2011. Um, so it's just, yeah, we just, it's these little things, you know, like I made a big stink about the Anwar al-Awlaki assassination back in 2011. And I think that um, there was a lot of pushback against that. Um, probably more in the legal community than there was um, in the populace at large, who seems to be pretty happy with the fact that we assassinated this guy who did seem to uh, play a part in uh, inspiring some uh, terrorist attacks. Um, but, you know, since 2011, um, there has not been an open and obvious assassination of a U.S. citizen by the U.S. government. So, yay! But these things, these, um, these precedents just sort of sit they don't go away. And whether it's four years from now, whether it's 40 years from now, those precedents sit there and can be used when something out of the ordinary happens. Um, you know, 9-11 transformed the United States from a country that was very leery about political assassinations to one that carries out political assassinations, at least on a weekly basis, against a certain class of people. Um, this justification, um, this idea that WikiLeaks is now an organization that we can pursue and disrupt in certain ways, uh, you know, under the early Trump administration, under the early Obama administration, we can assassinate U.S. citizens with no due process, you know, if these boxes get checked. Um, you know, that's stuff that's always going to be here now in, in U.S. law, in U.S. politics that can be sort of dusted off and applied to some other situation, whether it's two years from now or 40 years from now. Over the course of decades, there will be another 9-11 type thing. There will be some horrific attack, um, whether it's, um, it's likely to be completely different um, and surprising in a way, there'll be something that will encourage overreactions. And the toolboxes that we have from the last overreactions never really go away. Just briefly, one thing that is used to sort of explain away the significance of these revelations is that, you know, they were just sort of spitballing at the CIA. You know, they weren't, they weren't really, you know, going to do any of this. They were just, they were just plans, you know? Um, you know, it's just plans. Well, I think we've got a very recent example, uh, obviously sort of a, a very different situation where for a decade, um, you know, the United States just sort of had plans. They weren't really going to seriously do it. Nobody would be that insane to really think about killing Qasem Soleimani, the, the, the second most powerful person in Iran and a national hero. There's no way anybody would really think of doing that until, you know, the um, uh, U.S. president was in a political position where that seemed useful to him and we had enough sort of vengeful um, people in positions in the U.S. military that this sort of unthinkable thing that we're just sort of spitballing, we're just sort of trying it out, seeing how it's going, um, became a thing that happened and became a thing that we'll never be able to take back and became something that, I mean, probably 50%, if not more, of Americans think that killing, um, you know, Soleimani, like assassinating a high-level uh, person who was uh, in another government uh, that we were not at war with, um, on a mission of peace uh, in a country is, is just a-okay. And most Americans believe that. Um, they're wrong. Um, but, um, you know, that, that's something that's never going to be able to be taken back. That's something that's always going to be an idea um, that is something that is okay with both the U.S. public and the U.S. government now. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. It's just this sort of slump forward um, or slump downward. Um, and it's, it's really, really grim stuff. Um, and I wanted to talk about that. Uh, to close, um, I think it's sort of a running joke in the comments. It's sort of like, Rob, are, are you afraid now? Um, which is yeah, kind of hilarious, uh, sort of uh, overrates the reach that I have. Um, but also, um, you know, I am a uh, scurrilous uh, YouTube commenter who couldn't have less interest in the classified information of the U.S. government, operating on the assumption that none of those clowns are actually covering anything of interest other than their sordid, you know, wedding bombing plans. Um, but, um, yeah, the, the idea that, you know, I would ever be threatened by the U.S. government is, is ridiculous because, you know, this is something that started in 2014, um, you know, 
best case scenario, it'll be petering out in like 2030s, 2040s or something like that. Um, it's like, it's not, uh, you know, we're nowhere near a world where someone like me would have something to fear from the US government. But what if I started this YouTube channel in 2064 instead of 2014? Um, that I do think, um, I do think it is a little more plausible that like the kind of career that I'm having now, you know, this sort of setting myself up as sort of a curmudgeonly critic of the US foreign policy state or, or, or national security state, I think that 50 years from now, would that be a physically dangerous thing to do um, the way it is in Russia or uh, Egypt or any number of a con uh, any number of countries? Would that be a dangerous thing to do 50 years from now? Yeah, I, I think it. I think it could be, especially if we keep going down the trajectory that we are going. Um, so yeah, I think you should absolutely read this uh, Yahoo article, uh, which will be linked in the description. I think it is a very very big deal. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. And if you're one of those youngsters who has a TikTok account, would you consider going over there and following me there at More Freedom Foundation? That's at more Freedom Foundation. Uh, in recent months, I've just started uploading content there every day. And uh, it's really kind of surprising. Uh, TikTok seems a lot more interested in putting my stuff in front of large numbers of people than YouTube is anymore. Um, so uh, though I certainly have my concerns about TikTok, as I've already documented in a uh, recent video, um, that you know it helps me get eyeballs. Um, and I'll be able to get eyeballs more quickly if I have more subscribers over there. So uh, it's uh, TikTok at More Freedom Foundation. If you could hit that, that'd be great. Thanks. Oh. <sighs>